So it was about uh, 12 years ago, or 13 years ago, so 2002, I was studying over in Canberra and I received a phone call from my parents. And they were, they were calling me up to say that um, my sister had been in hospital and that they'd found a lump and that they reassured us that it wasn't going to be the C word at this stage. And then I received a phone call the very next day from my dad telling me that, well, basically calling me in tears, saying that it was in fact cancer and she was 14 years of age and had, they'd found a tumour in her hip. She then proceeded to have chemo and radiation and then had to get an all clear, get the all clear, and then was diagnosed with cancer again in her lung and then had to go through radiation again and then once coming out the other end of that was then diagnosed with uh, cancer on her spine for the third time. At the age of 22, she actually came out the other end after having her third lot of treatment, which was chemo and radiation again, and was all, all free and uh, ready to take on life. She spent the next year traveling the world and then now has started her own business down in Albany. It was during this period of time... Through those very long years where she was going through tri treatment, not once did she complain or say, why me? She always had the brightest personality and it actually really brought her out of her shell. She used to be quite a, a shy, nervous person and now she's a go-getter and has a zest for life. So there were positives that came out of it. It was also a massive inspiration for me and one of the main contributing factors of why I decided to take on the 2013 Bustledon Ironman. I decided to affiliate myself with the Council Council WA and raise money for the Council Council WA, which I believe is also what Dot's Place does as well in affiliation with Council Council WA. But like I said, in 2013, at the very beginning of 2013, I'd never ran or cycled a bike. I was with our, my wife and uh, two dogs, Lani and Buster, who weigh a combined total of three kilos each. <laughs> One is a Pomeranian and the other is a Choodle. Try and look manly walking those dogs along the coast. <laughs> I turned to my wife and I said, I want to try running. And she's like, what? Here? Now? Why? I was like, why not? So I set off. I wouldn't have made it more than a single step before my artificial leg flung off into the air. <laughs> I used my face to break my fall along West Coast Highway and my dog Buster ran off. <laughs> there was two girls on push bikes that were so horrified by what they'd just witnessed. <laughs> they avoided eye contact, said nothing at all and continued on cycling by. I turned to my wife, who had tears streaming down her face, of laughter, of course. She thought it was the funniest thing she'd ever seen. <laughs> I collected my leg, hunted down my dog Buster, and I called it a day. Now, quite simply, I could have quit there. I could have given up. That could have been me. Running was too hard. It was too difficult. And 28 years prior to that, I'd been telling myself, as an above-knee amputee, running is not for us. We don't run. It's not the sport that we're, we're designed to do. But I didn't stop there. I came back and I tried again and I was able to get a little bit further. Able to keep the leg on this time, which obviously helps. <laughs> and I was able to get a little bit further the next day until I was, I vividly remember celebrating the first time I ran 100 metres. How many people can actually recall the first time they ran 100 metres? And, <laughs> and then I was able to work myself up to a couple of hundred metres and then 500 and then a kilometre and eventually 5Ks. And it was around this time I said, hey, I'm going to try doing one of those charity fun runs. And as some of you may know, I'm affiliated with uh, the HBF Run for a Reason. You may have seen me running along the telly with a few followers. And so I signed up for the HBF Run. They had two options. There was the 4K and the 12K. So I thought, well, let's skip the 4. We'll go straight for the 12. I had one goal, was to be able to run the 12K without stopping. And on that day, I finished 12K in just over an hour and a half. I had chunks of skin and blisters from where my leg had just rubbed the flesh off for running for that period of time. But I finished without stopping. 
Just to go back a little bit, as you may know, I, was, I am missing one leg. And um, before I was born, my parents had an ultrasound and they said that everything checked out okay and then I came out with one leg. I, I, I would have assumed that two arms and two legs would be one of the major checklist items on an ultrasound. <laughs> But it, it did work really well, especially when my sister was going through treatment and I was in the Council Council WA at Ronald McDonald. Everyone would give me all the sympathy, thinking that I was the one suffering from cancer. And my poor sister would be left around there with no, everyone would be like, oh, she's fine. <laughs> so it worked well for me. Like I was saying, at the same time, I decided to start cycling. And cycling for me is a bit of a challenge because having my leg as the above the knee amputee is I don't have any control of where the lower half of the leg goes. So if I just let it go, it falls to where it wants and relies on momentum. So holding that leg on the pedal was impossible. My version of cycling as a kid was pushing my bike up a hill, sitting on the bike and rolling down the hill and then doing that again. It lost entertainment value pretty quickly. But I, I came across this technology of cleats where they actually, a shoe actually locks your foot to the pedal and so I thought this was my way of being able to cycle. So I got the shoe, and after 15 minutes of trying to clip my leg into the pedal, I was ready to throw the bike into the ocean and say, cycling is a stupid sport and no one should do it. <laughs> but I was able to get it done, and then after that it became easier and easier every time. So going back to December 8th, 2013, so just 12 months after I'd started running and cycling, there was 1,500 able-bodied athletes and myself standing on Bustledon Jetty. I don't know if this is going to work. But let's... So that's there is Bustledon Jetty, for those of you who can see it. The end of it is the halfway point of the swim. So you swim past the end of the jetty and then you make your way back. I let the siren go because there was 1,500 athletes that I didn't want to trample me during the start of the race and therefore not even make it to the water. So they ran in as the siren blasts at 6 a.m. I then made my way down to the beach on crutches and then gave those to a helper because I'm not a, I don't wear a leg when I swim, mainly because they consider it cheating in the, uh, the professional sporting world to wear two legs. <laughs> um, so I started swimming and I found something that was comfortable for me and I made my way to the end of the jetty. I was feeling really good, so I decided to pick up the pace and I found myself weaving through other athletes and I finished the swim in just over an hour and in the top 200 of the 1,500 athletes there. <laughs> Obviously, there wasn't a lot of strong kickers in that year. <laughs> I I grabbed my crutches and I made my way up to the transition area where I swap onto my cycling leg, get my bike ready and set off on the, the ride. Now, as you just heard, the ride is 180 kilometres. My drive from Perth to here was 150, so it's just a little bit further than that on the bike. It was three 60 kilometre laps. Leading up to the event, the furthest I ever rode was from Perth to Mandarin back, which is also about 150 kilometres. I jumped on the bike and I started riding. It was, a, it was a beautiful day. It was about 25 degrees, no wind when I started. I did the first lap and uh, it was starting to get a little bit uncomfortable after 60 k's and we still had 120 to go. The wind started to pick up a little bit and it was starting to get a bit warmer and I finished the 120 kilometers. Not feeling so comfortable anymore, starting to well and truly hate cycling and cut in places that you don't want to be cut in from the saddle and rubbing. I come through and I finish the third and final lap in just over five and a half hours. Give my bike to the support staff and say, you can keep it. <laughs> uh, make my way to transition, swap to my running leg and get ready for the short 42.2 kilometer marathon. Leading up to this event, the furthest I had ever ran in training was 21.1 kilometers. So I knew I could get halfway. The rest was just going to be up to the mind and willpower. So I set off. And the, I consider this the most entertaining part of the race to watch from a spectator point of view. Because we've been riding for five and a half plus hours, our legs are literally programmed to go in a cycling motion, yet we're trying to run. <laughs> we look highly uncoordinated, and I reckon it would be very entertaining for the spectators. But after a couple of k's, it warms up. 
Also, to give you an understanding, a lot of Ironman athletes consider the halfway point of the race the 21K part of the run. So they consider the first half is the swim, bike, and 21K run, and then the second half is getting through the 21Ks that follow it. I finished the first lap, and I was feeling you know, somewhat comfortable for someone who'd been exercising for eight plus hours. And I come through and I finish the second lap. I'm now at the furthest I've ever ran before, and we've got 21 Ks to go. I come through for the third lap. At the 30 K mark, I can feel that my little toenail is no longer attached. And every time I land on that shoe, it slides backwards and forwards. But hey, we've only got 12 Ks to go. So I set off. And every two and a half Ks, there's an aid station where you can have something to drink. And I was eating watermelon at that stage because it's the only thing I could stomach. And you, you, my goal was to make sure that I ran from aid station to aid station. So during the aid station, I'd grab a drink and keep walking. Every time that I came through an aid station, it got so much harder to start running. I couldn't stand still because then everything would cramp up and I'd probably just fall to the ground, seizing. But if I, to actually mentally will myself to start running again, got a little bit extra step every time that I would wait. One of the things that gave me a little bit of a pep in my step was when there was an incredibly fit young man that, I, that was walking and I ran past him and he was like, you've got to be freaking kidding me. <laughs> Such a jerk. And I was like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> Made it a little bit easier to run. Every time I passed a two-legged person, I had a little fist pump moment. I managed to make my way to the finishing shoot, gritting my teeth and giving it everything that I possibly had. And it was during this time the, the thoughts of my sister were a massive inspiration for me. Understanding what she had to go through and without complaining, and this was something that I chose to do where she didn't have a choice, and there are plenty of other people that are worse off than me in the world that do it without complaining. So I managed to suck it up and run down the finishing shoot in 11 hours, 49 minutes and 20 seconds. I was the first Australian above knee amputee to complete a full Ironman, and I don't think there's been one since. One thing about being the first is you either need to be really good or just the craziest. So I went for the craziest option. And I also did it in a world record time. It was around this stage when I fell in love with it. I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of an idea of what the the life of running for me was like. This was me when I was running in the HBF run. So this is my everyday leg. As you can see, it's not very comfortable. It doesn't look very smooth. I don't get any assistance out of my artificial leg. I basically land on it and then wait to get back to my real leg and then can move forward again. So yeah, it looks kind of like I've been shot or wounded and I'm just limping across to the finish line. So it was around just before the Ironman when I said, if I want to do this, it's time that I invest in something that's built to do it. Oh. <laughs> just going back, this is purely just thrown in there for the cute aspect of me being a little blondie with my very first artificial leg. So as you can see, it was about this high. My parents actually had to hunt around to find a place that could get a leg like this. So everywhere was offering a solution that was... Uh, basically a peg leg where I'd need the matching eye patch and parrot on my so shoulder like they did in the pirate movies. But we managed to find a place that would hand carve a leg on a lathe and out of one solid piece of wood and it had a strap that used to go around my neck to hold it on. I can't imagine it being overly comfortable but in those days you didn't care, you just got out there and did things. This is what I used to learn to walk. I had the trolley that I would push around and that was what gave me balance while I was learning to use a prosthetic leg. And it would have been just over the age of two, I would say, where we were at the Darwin Zoo with my family, and I just pushed the trolley away and started walking without it. Obviously, my parents weren't too concerned about me losing another limb because the Darwin Zoo is renowned for crocodiles, and I was walking around unassisted. <laughs> so this is the, uh, the carbon blade leg. Now, I bring it out because I consider it the Rolls Royce of artificial legs. So just one second. This is what fell over just before when... Uh, <laughs> but it's okay, it's pretty tough. 
So we'll do it without the mic at the moment. I'll give you an idea of the technology, guys. So this, this piece of equipment is phenomenal. It's called, I call it a blade leg or a running leg. It was made famous, as we were discussing over there, for some not so good reasons and some good reasons. The difference between me and Oscar and the fact that I don't own a gun <laughs> is that he's a double below knee amputee, so he's symmetrical. So he has the ability of being able to have the same equipment on both sides and it, it's um, quite efficient. Me being an above knee amputee, I don't have the knee, so I therefore can't control the lower part of the limb. And I'm not symmetrical, so one side fatigue's completely different to the other side. Just to give you an idea of the cost, so this little rubber shoe is $400 for that and wears out quite quickly. The carbon fibre blade is $5,000 and has a two year lifespan. So it's actually starting to deteriorate at the moment because I've put a few Ks on it. The knee is $6,000 and the total leg cost is $20,000. And like I say, it lasts for about two years. So this is an investment as an above knee amputee that you have to make without even knowing if you can use it. You have to go, hey, I want to try running, but I've got to make a $20,000 investment to see if it's something that I can potentially do. But it worked out okay for me. I'll show you. I'll show you the difference in running with the carbon fiber blade. Also, to give you an idea, it took us two hours to get that shot. The photographer made me do sprints for two hours. I've never been so sore after doing a training session. The Iron Man was less work than that, that photo right there. So this is me running with the blade leg. Now, I'm not saying it's her fault, but my wife was driving the car, so when it speeds up and slows down, I have to try and keep up with the car. But you can see there the difference in and, and how it changes my ability to run. So it makes running a lot more natural. That's what I basically explained to you. So the blade leg doesn't make running any easier for me. It hurts me just as much, if not more, to run because I have to use muscles that aren't designed for running. But it makes it feel natural. So it evens me out and it's balanced. And to give you an idea of the difference in speed, so when I started running on my everyday leg, I was around the the seven to, or six to seven minute kilometre mark. So it would take me about six to seven minutes to run a kilometre. Now I'm able to run a kilometre in just over four minutes per K. So I did a time trial in a triathlon just recently and I did a 22 minute 5K. So the goal is to get that down to 20 minutes, but you can see the difference in technology that's made for me, my ability to run. Swimming for me was um, something that I had, I picked up quite naturally and contrary to popular belief I am able to swim in a straight, well somewhat straight line with one leg but it was also, I mean I'm working very hard on technique here because I knew I was being filmed so I was even more focused but it was um, the, the part for me that I found easy and during school that was what I used uh, to kind of fit in so sport was always my way of being able to prove that I could do anything that anyone else could and swimming was where I was able to shine. I got selected to go to inter-school for my school and was something that was really quite enjoyable. I was never disciplined at it until I went down this path. So it was around this time, so towards uh, the beginning of 2014 when I discovered that triathlon was being introduced in the Paralympics in 2016. So this means that it's never been in the Paralympic sports, uh, in a Paralympic sport before and that I'm part of the group that could pioneer this sport and be one of the first Australians to represent our country in the Paralympics. <laughs> Thank you. I just recently returned from Chicago where, was the, where the 2015 World Championships were. This race did not go ideally for me. In fact, it was probably my most horrendous race that I've ever done. The distances for the Paralympics are different than the Ironman. So it's called a sprint distance triathlon, if there's such a thing. It's a 750 meter swim, a 20 kilometer bike ride, and a 5K run. And the idea is to do it flat out at 98% until the run where you try and vomit over the finish line. 
I'm at about an hour and 15 minutes now to do that, and the goal is to get down to about an hour and 10. In this race, my cycling leg was actually falling off during the whole bike ride, but I managed to keep it together, and I ran down the finishing chute, um, ranked sixth in the world. <laughs> the Australian qualifying standards are to finish sixth in the world at World Championships, to win Oceana in the beginning of January, or oh, sorry, beginning of February, and then to win one of the races in Penrith or Gold Coast. Now, both of those are highly achievable, and I've done the hardest part, which was finishing sixth in the world. So if everything goes well, I'll find out at the beginning of next year if I've qualified to represent Australia. And I'd love for you guys to join my journey and follow it through my, my social media. And also, if you, if you do feel like being able to contribute to the journey, you're more than welcome to sign up to get one of my No Excuses hats which will just be over there. You can just write your details down and I can send you the information. So, yeah, thank you very much for your time, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day.